Please welcome Morris Thiessen. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Martin. That was a great introduction. And uh, thank you very much for organizing a fabulous meeting. It is great to be back in Mount Bellew, the, uh, uh, the center of genetic genealogy for this part of Ireland. Uh, so what I'm going to be talking about is tools for uh, effective DNA use. Now, um, everybody, I assume, has done a DNA, project, uh, a DNA test. Um, this is going to be recorded for YouTube as well as being live streamed on Facebook. Um, you can find it on YouTube by just searching for my YouTube channel, DNA and Family Tree Research. I've also got a blog there as well. Um, now, the DNA testing strategy that I recommend for most people is to test an ancestry and then download a copy of your results to your computer and upload those results to Family Tree DNA, MyHeritage, uh, Living DNA, and GEDmatch. And then if you haven't found what you're looking for, you can do a separate test with 23andMe. And in that way, you're actually swimming in all of the gene pools out there, and that gives you access to potentially 30 million people. Uh, it's probably going up to more like 35 now, as Jared was saying earlier on. Um, but when you get your list of matches, ultimately what you want to do is you want to compare your family tree to their family tree. And um, various people are, are working on their family tree. Some people have a very well-developed family tree, and all of their ancestors are known back to maybe their great-great-grandparents. -grand Some people have only a partial family tree. Other people have a family tree, and one of the lines is completely wrong and inaccurate. And some people haven't even started yet, and they're just doing it for fun. They got it as a Christmas present. And guess who has to build their family tree? Probably you. So uh, it can be an awful lot of work. Now, the tools that can help you manage your matches are broken down into tools that help you sort your matches into different groups, maybe maternal versus paternal. You can sort your matches uh, by specific ancestor. And you can also use these various auto-clustering tools that have recently become available. A second group of tools are tools that help you estimate the probable relationship to your match. And that's tools like the Shared Centimorgan tool on DNA Painter, the Watto tool on DNA Painter, and I'll show you briefly what a Maguire chart looks like as well. And then you've got tools that help identify and track triangulated segments, which can be very, very useful for proving that a particular uh, match is related to you by a, a very specific ancestor. And that can be very, very important, especially if you come from a small, isolated, rural community where second cousins are marrying second cousins, and you have people saying, oh yes, that's my second cousin on my father's side, but she's also my third cousin on my mother's side. So you get these double connections happening within the family. And then lastly, I'm going to talk briefly about how to reconstruct your ancestor's DNA and how that can be also very, very helpful in identifying where your matches are situated in the family tree. So to start off with then, just how to sort your matches. You've got about 1,000, 2,000, 10,000, even 30,000 matches. You don't want to go through all of them. You want to sort them into groups that help you focus your research. Now the first of the tools is the, uh, the bucket tool, the maternal and paternal bucket tool on family tree DNA. And here is a list of the uh, matches that I have, for example, on family tree DNA. And you can see that uh, the names are here on the left-hand side. You have the total amount of centimorgans down here, uh, the longest segment, whether they're an X match and so on. And um, up here you have a paternal tab and you can see there's 843 in there, and a maternal tab, 334 in there. Um, and I'm just going to move this over here because it's probably easier for me to show you all using the computer rather than using the, uh, the screen, and it saves me having to turn around. So I have 2,800 uh, matches altogether, but 800 are paternal and 300 are maternal. Um, and this is a very, very useful way of uh, dividing your, your, your matches. The maternal ones have this little red icon here, and the paternal ones have this little blue icon here. Now, um, a lot of people will, will, will know how to use this, but I've got a little trick. Um, you can put your family tree up there, 
and if there are known matches within your family tree, you can click on that uh, person and, and add link their DNA results to your family tree. Um, and you can do that, that's quite easy. But um, what I like to do is I like to uh, force uh, unknown matches into my family tree. So I don't know where they fit. Uh, I don't know whether they're on my mother's side or my father's side, unless they match other people. So if I have a known match, I will see what are the matches they share with me, and then what I will do is I will force a match into the tree. So for example, here's me, and if I click on add relationship, and then click on father, and then confirm, I can uh, put in dad, uh, and there it is there, and there I have my dad. So I'm just building a tree from scratch here. And then I can click on dad, and I can do the same thing and add his father, and call that granddad. But then underneath granddad, I can put in any matches. They're obviously the wrong place in the family tree, but if I know that it's definitely a match on my paternal side because it matches my dad's first cousin, I can actually force a person into the tree. So if I add a daughter, for example, I can start typing in the name Patricia, and Family Tree automatically says, well, there is a Patricia in your list of matches. This is probably the Patricia you mean. Do you want to link this particular Patricia that you're entering in the Family Tree to this DNA match? And I do, but what I don't want to do is I don't want this box here to be clicked. It says, when I click link, email that person about being added to my tree. Well, I don't want an email going to her saying, you've just been added in a very strange position on Morris's family tree. So I untick that, and then I click on link, and then that person, Patricia, is forced into my family tree. The advantage of doing that is that on the net, when you go back to uh, your family finder matches, you get this message saying calculating family matching. And anyone who matches that particular DNA match that you've forced into the family tree will get added to that paternal bucket there. So it's a very useful way of just forcing um, uh, uh, matches into the paternal bucket or the maternal bucket. Um, now, another feature is the new um, colored buttons feature on Ancestry, which has only become available in the last few, few months. And you find it under the Extras tab, and then you go to the Ancestry lab, and then you click on um, the colored buttons tab there, and it will bring up, um, it will allow you to use colored buttons, and you can apply those buttons to various people in your matches list. And this helps you to sort your matches not just by maternal and paternal, but by specific ancestors. So for example, here are a list of uh, some of my dad's matches, and you can see that the, I've got colored buttons here. There's a, a pink, there's a darker pink, there we've got blue as well. And what I've done is I've created groups. The pink is maternal, the blue is paternal, and I've also created a special group for John Gleason and his wife Anne, uh, for Joseph O'Carroll and his wife Maria Jane Dockery, and for Patrick Spearin and his wife Mary. And then what I can do is once I've identified um, known uh, cousins within my matches list, I can then go to all matches and then click on uh, a specific one. And if I click on Joseph O'Carroll, these are all of the matches that are known um, relatives, known descendants of Joseph O'Carroll and um, his wife, Maria Jane Dockery. And of course, anyone who also matches these matches are likely to be connected to me via my ancestors, Joseph O'Carroll and Mary Jane Dockery. And this way, you can cluster your matches into groups that are related to you via a particular pair of your ancestors, uh, in this case, Mr. and Mrs. O'Carroll. Uh, so that's a, another very, very useful feature that allows you to separate your matches and organize them. Because if all, for, so for example, anyone who matches Joseph O'Carroll and Maria Jane Dockery, I can say, uh, I can write to them and I say, you know, you're, you're related to me on this side of my family. So do you have any O'Carrolls or Dockeries in your family? And they came from Roscommon and from Leash. Does that ring any bells? And it really helps focus your research in that way. Now, unfortunately, my heritage doesn't have these kind of buttons. 
And this is a feature that you get throughout your research is that one website has a wonderful tool that isn't present on the other websites. Um, but what my heritage does have is they have a notes feature. So what I do is I put paternal or maternal in a note beside each of the matches. Cumbersome and not as pretty as having nice colored dots. But what they do have is um, the auto cluster function. Now, the auto clustering only became available relatively recently, and it was developed by um, Evert Jan Blom from uh, the website Genetic Affairs. And if you scroll down, you come across this wonderful, and look at this wonderful diagram. This is the auto clustering happening live. Now, remember when you bought your first washing machine and you just got a chair and sat in front of it and you put a wash on, you just wash, watch the clothes going around. We've all done it. Um, this is what I was doing when I first saw this. I just sat there watching it for a couple of minutes and, you know, it was like getting your first new washing machine in 20 years. So it's, it's a wonderful feature. And you can see that it's clustering matches that share each other as matches in these lovely little clusters. And the theory is that each cluster is related to you via one of your specific ancestors. And you can see here that he's put, um, uh, when, when it comes back again, he's, he's actually labeled one cluster as uh, uh, the, the maternal paternal, so the mother's father's side. Another cluster is the father's mother's side. Another cluster is the father's father's side. Another cluster is the mother's father's side, and so on. And you can go back even further than that, the mother's father's father's, and so on. So it's a wonderful uh, tool that Everett Jan Blom uh, created. It has been integrated into MyHeritage, and it, um, you can also use it on the other websites via his uh, website, Genetic Affairs. So you can run this for your 23andMe matches, your Family Tree DNA matches, and your Ancestry DNA matches. And it has recently come to GEDmatch, and I'm going to show that to you in a while. And that has only happened in the last week or so. But uh, here is an example of how uh, these clusters uh, help us achieve our goal, which is ultimately you want to compare your family tree with your matches family tree. And um, here you are. Here are uh, a variety of family trees associated with this particular cluster down here. Some people have no tree. Some people have a full tree. Some people have trees with inaccurate data in them. But at least it allows you to focus your research on a specific people and their specific trees. The theory is, of course, that all members of a cluster have a common ancestor, but like I said, you have to be aware that there might be double connections there, there might be half-cousins, there might be um, surname or DNA switches, adoptions, illegitimacies, fostering, that type of thing, and that can throw a spanner in the works. So that is the aim of uh, comparing your tree with other people's trees, and hopefully you'll be lucky enough when you do compare your tree with someone else's tree, as in this case, that you find a common ancestor within your respective family trees. And here we can see that both trees have the ancestors Gordon Jones and Kate Morgan. And that means that you can have established your connection. Now, the, once you've found that common ancestor, it may very well be that having exchanged information you can break through a brick wall in your family tree. Uh, you might be able to get photographs of those ancestors that the other person has that you don't. Uh, you might have family stories. You might have information that solves a family mystery that has been in your family for decades, and they have the answer. So this is how uh, breaking through these brick walls and collaborating with your matches can lead to wonderful uh, discoveries. Um, on my Morgan side, I was able to push it back through one connection. I was able to put it, push it back five generations to Limerick in the early 1600s. And they were a, a junior branch of the Morgans of Tredegar in Wales. And that took me back to um, Sir Edward Morgan in 1571 and all the way back to Noah. But uh, among the uh, descendants of Sir Edward Morgan are somebody called J.P. Morgan. Have you heard of Morgan Chase Stanley? Yes. Somebody called um, Captain Morgan from the Battle Bottle of Rum. So I'm related to Sir Henry, er, Sir Henry Morgan, who was uh, governor of Jamaica, and somebody called Princess Diana. So I'm something like the 10th or 11th cousin to Prince Harry. And uh, I was joking with people I might get invited to the wedding last May. 
And uh, somebody I said, said uh, told a story to said, well, that's a coincidence because I'm going and I've got a spare ticket. So, <laughs> so I was this close to getting invited to Prince Harry's wedding um, when I was doing a tour of Australia at the time, so I couldn't actually go. So anyway, you never know what you're going to find. Um, Jetmatch takes these clusters one step further. Because all these clusters are saying is that everybody in this cluster matches each other. But with Jetmatch, uh, what you can do is you can find out how closely related everybody within that cluster is. Because some of them might be second cousins to each other, some of them might be fifth cousins to each other, and you don't know just by looking at that colored box. But what Jetmatch allows you to do is, <clears throat> and this is the old way before the new way came along, you can still do this. If you go to the one-to-many DNA comparison, and then you highlight the number of boxes that you want to compare, then you click on visualization options. Uh, then if you go to the matrices button and then click on generations, it will actually sort the matches into clusters. And you can see the, um, the makings of these square boxes all along the diagonal here. Then what you can do is you can take each of those clusters one by one and just highlight the matches within each cluster. So if we just highlight the matches again within each specific cluster, go to visualization options again, and this time go to the matrices function but click on autosomal matrix, then it gives you this wonderful autosomal matrix of the amount of DNA shared for that particular cluster of people, all of whom, of course, are likely to share the same common ancestor. So that's the way that we used to do it. But now, and in fact, within this cluster, you notice two things. You see that those uh, B and C up there share 3,500 uh, centimorgans. This is a parent-child relationship. So already looking at those values tells you a lot. And also the ones down here um, at the bottom uh, 831, which is K, and 831, which is I. Uh, the I and K would be probably first cousins, could be a half-nephew, but it tells you, again, how those people are related to each other. The remainder of the people, all 25s and 30s, and uh, sometimes in the teens, they're more likely to be the fourth cousin, fifth cousin level. And that might be beyond the reach of documentary evidence. So already, because you've got a much more detailed uh, box of shared DNA uh, results and values, it tells you a lot more about the nature of the relationships between people in that particular cluster. But just in the last week or two, um, JEDmatch has brought in the auto-clustering tool, um, and that allows you, if you've got Tier 1 access, to click on that. Um, you can put in any... Uh, match number here at all. So you put in your kit number there. You can lower the threshold, raise the threshold. I have experimented with up to 250 and down to 25. And this is the kind of um, lovely uh, diagram, which is quite visually stunning, that I get for my matches. And I can tell just by looking at the people that are in this first cluster that these are people that go back uh, that, that are related to me via my great-great-great-grandparents, Timothy Gleason and Catherine Ryan. And that really helps me focus my research. Um, the other ones, I'm not so sure, uh, but I, again, it allows me to say, these people are relate, related to me, what is the common ancestor, and I can go looking for that common ancestor. And then, of course, you can click on these boxes here, say, for example, this first orange box, and that will allow me to submit to multi-kit analysis, and I can then again get the actual centimorgans shared uh, for each of the people in that particular cluster, which allows me to roughly place where they're going to be in relation to each other. So that's sorting your matches. The next one is estimating the probable relationship to a match. And to, for this, you need, uh, well, we're going to talk about the shared centimorgan tool, the Watto tool, and the Maguire chart. Now, the shared centimorgan project uh, tool is on the DNA Painter website, developed by Johnny Pearl, Leah Larkin, and Andrew Millard. And you simply put in the amount of DNA that you share with match, and it will generate a list of relationship probabilities. 
And this is really useful for trying to, to uh, visualize where your match sits in your family tree. So for example, if we put in 157, it comes back with uh, the results that there's a 53% probability that the relationship is somewhere in this first bundle of relationships. And within that first bundle of relationships, the most common uh, among them would be a second cousin once removed. In the second bundle of relationships, there's a 26% chance it's one of these. The most common within this bundle would be second cousin. And in the third bundle of relationships, there's a 14% chance it's, it's one of these. And the most common relationships, uh, relationship within this bundle would be the third cousin relationship. So it's a great way of just getting some idea of where the person sits and how likely it is this relationship or that relationship. The Watto tool, what are the odds, is also very, very helpful, especially if you're working with adoptees or a foundling or someone with unknown parentage, because um, they will have matches and you're trying to place the adoptee within the family tree of somebody else. So in this particular situation, uh, Peter uh, is a match at 451, Edward is a match at 201, and I can place the adoptee in various places on this particular family tree. Um, we call them hypothesis one, two, three, four, five. And in this particular situation, hypothesis five is not possible. It's a score of zero. Uh, hypothesis one and four, oh no, that's a seven. Hypothesis one is just a score of one, but the most likely hypothesis is hypothesis two with a score of 673 which basically means it's 673 times more likely to be this configuration than any other configuration. And that's very, very helpful for uh, focusing your research once again. This is a Maguire chart, and this is a very, very nice way of representing uh, very complex information. So you've got a family tree, maybe three or four, five or six of your cousins have tested, and this allows you to um, uh, place your known cousins and their matches in a family tree, and it helps estimate the relationships between the known cousins and an unproven cousin. So in this particular example, which is taken from uh, Blaine Bettinger's uh, blog post, um, this was a uh, situation where uh, there were one particular person had married two, potentially two sisters, and they're trying to figure out just exactly what the most likely relationship is. And uh, again, this is, if you like, the, the matrix of autosomal DNA values translated into a family tree form. So it's just another way of taking the data and, and visualizing it, uh, in this, this case, putting it into a family tree form. Because what you have here really is a matrix. And uh, within this matrix, you have, um, and I'm not sure if you can read it down there, but it is, um, they have the DNA tester. And uh, here on the right hand side, you've got um, a variety of different possible relationships, and then the amount of DNA shared by everyone with everyone else within this tree, highlighting uh, that uh, the, what, what is likely in this situation is that we're either looking at uh, these people are the descendants of this person here, either via Concetta, which is this person over here, or her sister. So it could very well be that this person uh, was married but then had an affair with um, um, his sister-in-law. So. That is how a Maguire chart can actually help, especially when you get down to the lower DNA matches, the fourth cousin matches, uh, where you have maybe only 30 or 40 centimorgans of DNA, and you, it's much more difficult to draw conclusions from those very, very small amounts of DNA data. Lastly, uh, well, second last, identify and track triangulated segments. This is something that is done on MyHeritage, and it's another example where MyHeritage is a wonderful tool, but it's not present on the other websites. And uh, it's indicated by this little icon here, and there is the triangulated match, and if you hover over that, then it actually gives you the amount of overlap 
uh, with the uh, segments. So it's an eight centimorgan overlap in these two segments. And this can be very, very useful if you want to put together a proof argument, um, especially if you're going back before the 1800s into the 1700s, maybe even into the 1600s, and you want to actually prove that a particular segment of DNA has come from a specific ancestor. Because obviously, if you're going back into the 1700s and the 1600s, the chances of a second connection within your family get higher and higher and higher the further you go back. So this is actually a very, very useful way of minimizing the chances that what you're looking at is, in fact, not a connection via the ancestor you're hoping it to be, but a second connection via some unknown ancestor in some other part of the tree. So using these triangulated segments can be very, very useful for proof arguments. DNA GEDCOM is another website that has a wonderful um, uh, chromosome browser. This is like the mega chromosome browser. It's like you put all your matches into the chromosome browser at the same time. Uh, again, this is free, but it also is very helpful for identifying uh, potential pileups. So for example, here, you can see that all of these segments are on top of each other, and they're exactly the same value, 8.16, 8.16, 8.16. It's quite possible that this relatively small segment has actually been knocking around the population for many, many, many generations. It might look like you might be connected within the last 300 years. In fact, that's been there for 3,000 years. Because it's in a part of the chromosome, for example, that codes for immunogenicity the immune reaction. And a lot of people need that DNA, and so that's why it's present all the time. So there are these pileup areas, and especially if you're looking at very, very small DNA segments, there's always that query, is this really in the last 300 years, or is it maybe something that's a lot further back? So that's the ADSA um, segment as analyzer on DNA GEDCOM. Uh, GEDmatch has a variety of different tools, all very, very uh, helpful and useful. The triangulation tool is one that um, accomplishes the same kind of thing that we saw on uh, MyHeritage. Um, and the DNA Painter is also uh, another very, very useful uh, piece of software developed by Johnny Pearl on the DNA Painter website. And this allows you to actually paint DNA that you've inherited from specific ancestors. So you can see on a diagram of all of your chromosomes where uh, different segments have been inherited from different people. So for example, my uh, great-grandparents, uh, H.T.O. Carroll and Elizabeth Spearin, have given me, uh, one of them has given me these segments here, one or the other, these uh, blue, uh, pink segments. Um, here's a Spearin segment from 1750. Um, here's Patrick Spearin or Mary Morgan specifically, the dark pink ones. Um, and then Timothy Gleason uh, is this green segment here. So it's a nice visual way of seeing who, uh, which segments have been inherited from which ancestors. And of course, if you get a match on somebody with somebody who matches you on one of, the, say, on the green segment, then I know that that person has got to be related to me via Timothy Gleason and Catherine um, Ryan. So it's, again, it can be a helpful shortcut to paint this type of um, picture. Now, it can also be used for other things. So for example, if you want to look at uh, triangulated segments, um, you can uh, do this kind of chart. And this is really just comparing A with B, A with C, A with D, B with C, B with D, C with D. And you get a variety of different comparisons, and you can see what um, segments of DNA have been passed down to descendants of a single ancestral couple. So you can modify and adapt this tool for a variety of different uh, uses other than painting your own ancestral DNA segments. Um, and it's interesting when you do use it for triangulated segments because uh, most triangulated segments are only shared by about three people. It's very rare for you to actually find four people with the same triangulated segment and five people is virtually impossible, six piece people probably never heard of. Um, and there at the very, very top, you can see that's the only segment that has been passed down from this ancestral couple to four people. Normally, a segment is only passed down to at most three people, and there's only one um, of the descendants, one, one uh, group of four descendants that have uh, inherited a specific uh, triangulated segment from this 
ancestral couple. So that's DNA Painter, um, and that's the website. Uh, there's a very, very useful introductory video on that by Blaine Bettinger, so I'd certainly encourage you to watch that video. It only goes on for about um, 40 minutes, um, but is well worthwhile uh, looking. And the last thing then is to reconstruct your ancestors uh, using the Lazarus function on GEDmatch. And this can be very, very useful and can reveal the secrets within your DNA matches that were not apparent when you're just dealing with uh, living people. And to do this, you go to the Lazarus function on GEDmatch. And um, Martin McDole has done a very, very uh, useful video of this um, at Genetic Genealogy Ireland Belfast back in 2018. Um, called Raising the Dead, because it was around about Halloween that we were doing this. Um, and um, it, he, he found this incredibly very, very uh, useful for identifying <coughs> cousins to, the, um, to your ancestor. And you basically can reconstruct up to, up to I've heard someone say, up to 99% of your ancestral DNA, depending on how many of their descendants have actually been tested. So all of the descendants will have inherited DNA from this particular ancestor. And if you take this, those ancestral segments from this person, those ones from this person, put them all together, you can actually reconstruct the uh, DNA signature of a long dead ancestor like a grandfather or a great grandfather. And that can be very, very helpful. Is there a one-stop shop where you can uh, where, the diff where the, there, are, there are different tools and different websites, but is there a one-stop shop where you can pull it all together uh, in a single place from all the direct-to-consumer companies and so that you can work on the data from all the companies with all the tools in the one place? No, there isn't. <laughs> that's, the, that's the sad news. But there is um, a software program called Genome Mate Pro, which really is for the pros, where you can actually pull data in from various companies and work on it in all the one place. Now, they don't have all the tools, but it is certainly the most um, comprehensive of the software programs out there that allow you to pull everything in from different sources. The only problem is it takes eight hours to set it up. Uh, so it's, a, it's very, very time intensive. But then once you do get it set up, then it becomes your one-stop shop for working with your DNA matches. Um, you can, and it brings them in from family tree DNA, 23andMe, uh, ancestry, my heritage, and living DNA. I do a kind of a manual effort. So when I'm working with adoptees, and these are my last few slides, I, uh, I just simply use a, a, an Excel spreadsheet, and I have adapted it to incorporate a lot of the stuff that you've seen in some of the previous tools. So to illustrate how this works, I'm going to tell uh, Peter's story. And Peter is here with us today, Peter Mulryan. Um, he's uh, very kindly allowed me to reveal his identity. Um, but I have anonymized uh, a lot of the information. But uh, Peter was born in 1944, raised in a children's home in Tuam. Um, uh, he met his birth mother in 1975, um, but didn't know who his birth father was. So we started working on the paternal side of his family, and luckily one of his maternal first cousins had done the test, so we were able to separate his matches into maternal, which could be eliminated, and paternal, which is where we wanted to focus our research. And looking at, and this is the adoptee uh, spreadsheet, I put in the username and the name, I've locked them out now, one of them is the yellow group, one of them is the orange group, I assign them, assign them an ID letter, I put the company, A is for ancestry, FT for family tree DNA. You can see there's three family tree DNA uh, matches, and the rest of them are ancestry. I put in the total amount of shared centimorgans, and they're around the um, 100 mark, so that's going to be maybe a third cousin, possibly second cousin once removed. I put in the possible relationship based on that information, and then I look at what matches share other matches. And that means going through each match in turn and seeing who else they match. And by doing that, I can see that A, C, and E are, are very close matches to each other. And then there's K, N, and P who will also match within that group. They all match A or C. So they all go into the yellow group. 
not everybody <coughs> matches each other, but they match other people within the group, so they can be clustered in the yellow group. And then uh, in the orange group, we've got BDF, GHIMOP. Um, some of them are match most of the people, some of them match only a few, but we put them together into the orange cluster. And looking at the orange cluster, what I do is I put the um, ancestor here on the left-hand side and then the match here on the right-hand side, and this is the line of ascent to the common ancestor. So I had to compare the family trees of all of these matches to see where is the intersecting point. Problem is, uh, I could only go back so far with some of the matches, and um, uh, I couldn't identify a common ancestor. But the orange cluster had ancestors called Grealish, Duggan, Greeley, who married a Greeley, um, Greeley and Greeley, Greeley and Greeley, um, there wasn't any one common ancestral couple that I could identify, but it was going back to some very specific surnames. Uh, the, there was uh, some suggestions of double connections, cousins marrying cousins. You can see the, here that a Peter Greedy marries an Honor Greedy, and that's going to confuse the picture because it means that their descendants are going to have more DNA than would be normal for um, people who don't have second connections. So I switched over to the um, yellow cluster, and again, a lot of people didn't reply, didn't have a family tree, or didn't reply to messages. Um, some of them went back to a George Brown and a Mary Mulrooney. Uh, this one went back to a John Brown. This one went back to Patrick Brown. So certainly within the yellow cluster, Brown was a familiar name. But again, no single common ancestor could be identified. And we're back at the at the end of Irish records. You know, we're back to the 1800 time point. We're not going to get any record before then unless we're really, really lucky. But when I mentioned the name to Brown to Peter, that rang a bell because um, a neighbor of Peter's mother had looked after her during her confinement. And this was only a, you know, it's, it's, this was a piece of information that came out when the name Brown was mentioned. Oh, now that you mentioned Brown, that reminds me. So we had a clue here that perhaps this Mr. Brown, who was Peter's mother's neighbor, might have something to do with his paternity. And so we switched focus from, um, from the DNA to this specific Mr. Brown. Now the interesting thing is that um, all of the yellow group went back to this cluster of townlands in East Galway, and all of the orange group went back to this cluster of townlands in East Galway. And Martin's going to talk about maps later on. And this is a very, very useful way of saying you're on the right track because the yellow cluster ancestors are actually living beside the orange cluster ancestors. And focusing on um, Mr. Brown, we found he had uh, two siblings. On his father's side, uh, his father was Thomas Brown. And it went back to George Brown and Mary Mulrooney, who were an ancestral couple in the yellow group. And then on Mr. Brown's mother's side, it went back to Margaret Greeley, and her parents were Greeley and Duggan, surnames we encountered on the orange side. So it looked like we had, were on the right track, and that we actually had found a candidate for Peter's father. But the next question was, is there anyone we can test within that closer family that would actually help confirm that we were on the right track. And that meant building out the family tree, and by so doing, we actually found a first cousin of Mr. Brown was still alive and living in England. There was a 40-year difference between the birth of Mr. Brown and the birth of his first cousin. He was born in 1895, she was still alive, born in 1935, we got in touch with her daughters, explained the situation, uh, they spoke to their mother, and she very kindly agreed to do a DNA test. And the kind of uh, relationship you'd be expecting, if, if she was a first cousin to Mr. Brown, and if he was Peter's father, then Peter and this woman should share, um, should be a first cousin once removed relationship, they should share approximately 440 <laughs> centimorgans, the DNA results came back, 427 centimorgans. Just exactly what you'd expect. 
for our first cousin once removed relationship. And this proved with, re with, with beyond reasonable doubt, uh, with 99% confidence that we actually had found the right candidate for Peter's father. And then if we went back to the adoptee template uh, spreadsheet, uh, we can fill in the known relationships. Now on, this is Peter here, on the yellow side, on the brown side, he has a second cousin once removed relationship with this person, and that fits the DNA evidence. Uh, the, this person here is a second cousin twice removed. Again, it fits the DNA evidence. These people we don't know, they're probably second cousins twice removed, but we don't have family trees to actually prove that. And then on the green, on the um, orange side, the Greeley and Duggan side, we have proof that one of his Greeley first cousins once removed comes up as that on the DNA test. The rest of the people on the, on the orange side, because there's so many double connections, we can never be sure exactly where they fit in. But we have enough evidence to state beyond reasonable doubt that we have found Peter's father. So that's an example of how you can use this, just a single spreadsheet, where it summarizes a huge amount of data in one place from all the different companies. In this case, it was mainly ancestry and family tree DNA. And it's just a very nice visual way of explaining to people, here's the evidence, this is what we conclude from it. Now, Peter uh, did not do the DNA test initially to find his father. Peter did the DNA test to find his sister. And she uh, apparently died at the age of 10 months old in the home. Now, there is talk about whether some of these children had their death certificates uh, forged, and maybe they were sold to American couples. And what Peter was hoping was that if this was the case, that maybe by doing the DNA test, he would find a sister that he had not, that he'd never seen and that he wasn't aware of until about five years ago or so. Unfortunately, she did not turn up in the database. So she either died in the home or she's somewhere in America or elsewhere and isn't aware that she was adopted and hasn't done the DNA test and is not yet in the databases. Um, or unfortunately, she might be one of the children that are buried in uh, Chum. Um, and if that is the case, then uh, the excavations that are currently ongoing um, may very well be able to identify her remains and allow her to have a burial in a, a proper Christian uh, manner. So it very, it's very possible that the tool we've been talking about today and the methodology we've been talking about today could be used to help identify some of those ch uh, children at Chum or in any mass grave situation. Just like we're identifying serial killers in the US, uh, rapists, unidentified human remains, it's a very, very powerful tool that we have, and we need to protect it and use it wisely um, and judiciously. So with that, I'm going to end, um, and thank you very much for your kind attention. Absolutely wonderful, and as well, huge thank you to Peter for allowing that story to be there. And I think we Is there any questions? Yes, Marie. I'm looking at my uh, family tree DNA family finder matches page here. Now you said when you looked at yours there, you had uh, so many more paternal and so many maternal. I don't have that in mine. There's zero for both. That's true because you have to actually link those matches to the family tree that you build yourself on family tree DNA. Have you got a family tree on family tree DNA? you would have put it up yourself either, you can upload it as a GEDCOM, or you can put it in manually, which is a bit of a pain. <coughs> I, have, I have four kits on it. I only have it with one kit. Grand. Well, what I, I can show you actually how to do that, but you need to have a fam your family tree on family tree DNA, yeah. and then you need to physically, manually link each of your matches to that tree, and once they're linked to the tree, when you go back and refresh your matches list, it goes clunk, 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 and calculates family relationships and puts a whole tranche, a whole block of matches into the paternal bucket or a whole tranche or block of matches into the maternal bucket. So it's, 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 a, it's a bit of a pain in the neck, but you have to do it manually. I'll show, I'll show you how to do it during the break. Thank you. Sorry. Question here. I've done my 
my brother, so I've done Hawaii, and then I've done my own. So that's what you mean when you're joining them together, is it? Or I've told them on um, my family tree DNA. Right, okay. Have you done the autosomal DNA test? Uh, you're not sure, so not no, sure. Yeah. The, the everything history or family tree DNA. Have you done which yes, test have you done? Yes, family tree DNA. Right, okay. The family finder. Yes. yes. The family okay. finder, okay. Yes. okay. If um, All of this, what I've been talking about, relates to the autosomal yes. DNA test, which okay. is the family finder test. Okay. Um, it doesn't relate to the Y DNA or the mitochondrial DNA test. Oh, okay. It's only about autosomal, and the autosomal test looks at all of your chromosomes apart from the Y chromosome. Okay. And it doesn't look at the mitochondrial DNA either. Okay. So those are two separate tests but it covers all of your ancestors going back to about your 64 great, 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 great grandparents. Okay, brilliant. Yeah. Thank you. Question here? Just, you, you mentioned earlier the, the Lazarus test and, and raising the dead. Um, you kind of alluded to the fact that maybe was it, was it possible to identify a particular ancestor or, or is it the case that it would be a couple? Are you raising a yeah. couple or are you raising one, if you know what I mean? Sure, no, that's a very good question. Um, your... Um, it depends on how you use it, because I've, my mum passed away before I could test her, so um, what I've done is I've taken my dad's DNA and four of my siblings, myself and three other siblings' DNA. Um, obviously the siblings are inheriting uh, DNA from both mum and dad, but what we do is we generate the file and then subtract dad's contribution, leaving us with mum's contribution. So you could do Lazarus further back with grandparents and that sort of thing. Um, and Lazarus is not the only software that actually does this. But going back in time is a little bit more difficult. And like you say, it's very difficult to uh, separate Mr. Ancestor from Mrs. Ancestor. Unless you actually have specific descendants of Mrs. Ancestor's family that can then be eliminated from the equation. Okay. Yeah. So you have to have siblings, right, to do the Lazarus for the Lazarus kid, you need siblings, yeah. yeah. Preferably at least three. Well, yourself and two other siblings, yeah. 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 And just one last sure. question. How confident would you be if the uh, Sidon Kuhn was um, tested out? That, um, I, according to records, my first cousin is possibly very there. Yeah. Um, there's three major hurdles to be overcome if you're going to be using genetic genealogy techniques at Chewham. You know, and before they would start using these techniques, they'd um, exhaust the possibilities from using the ordinary tests that they do, like the forensic tests um, uh, that they would do in any kind of uh, crime scene investigation or any kind of mass grave situation. So it would be kind of, this wouldn't be the first stage, it would be maybe stage three or stage four that they started using these techniques. Uh, these techniques have great potential, but there's three major hurdles. First hurdle, can we get enough DNA from the remains? Now typically, you need at least 20 nanograms of DNA uh, in order to run the type of DNA tests we want to run, whole genome sequencing or microarray chip. Um, in some of the cases where they find World War I soldiers, and have, you know, which are 100 years old, and they've managed to extract DNA, Typically, the amounts you're looking at are picograms, <coughs> one picogram, and one picogram is one thousandth of a nanogram. So if you need 20 nanograms and you're only getting one picogram, it's 20,000 times less than you actually need. That's a challenge. Um, however, the technology is advancing so fast that what we need 20 nanograms today, next year it could be two nanograms, the year after that it could be 200 picograms, and soon you're going to be down to the one picogram level. So again, that's the first hurdle. Second hurdle is, what do you compare it to? And uh, we're very lucky in this particular locality that a lot of people have done the DNA test and there's a very good reference database. Much stronger than, say, you'd have in the UK, where a lot of people are not testing because they've got parish records that go back to the 1500s and the attitude is, why would I need to do a DNA test? I've got records that can take me back further than any DNA test can. So a lot less people in the UK have done the DNA test. So we're lucky here that in Ireland we're actually testing more people per head of the population than a lot of other places. And then the third uh, hurdle will be actually getting somebody to do the analysis. 
So you, you saw the kind of analysis that I've done for, for Peter's um, particular case. And um, Peter and Trina and Kathleen will know that it takes a lot of work. And it's very, very time intensive. Um, and you have to know what you're doing. You have to try and put everything together. There's not that many people that can do this type of work, um, which is why you know, having these kind of conferences is great, because it helps upskill people um, and gives them the potential to be able to contribute to this type of effort. Um, most of the expertise is in the States, in the US, um, but I think we can develop our own expertise within Ireland. So those would be the three major hurdles. But once, but you know, if you can overcome those three hurdles, then I think there's a very, very good chance because we have such a good reference population here in and around the Chewham catchment area that we could actually identify quite a few of the children in the pit. Um, and if we're able to get the DNA into the databases, I would estimate that we'd have at least a 50% chance of identifying uh, any given child. Thank you for that. Would it be a good idea for the universities to take it on board as a project for their students? Sure. Um, they are they are involved to an extent. Uh, certainly, Professor Dan Bradley's Ancient DNA Lab in Trinity College Dublin could do the uh, type of extraction analysis that we would need. So could uh, Professor Ron Pinhazi's lab in University College Dublin. And both uh, Professor Dan Bradley and some of Ron Pinhazi's team have already written to the Irish Times and the national papers saying that do not be pessimistic about extracting DNA um, because we have been doing it with ancient DNA from 5,000 years ago in Ireland in our labs. So the technology is there, and in actual fact, it's people like Professor Dan Bradley and Professor Ron Pinhazi that are at the forefront of improving the technology for extracting the DNA and getting enough of a sample to put into these um, uh, tests that we need to run. Thank you very much. Mark. And our final speaker before we have lunch is going to be Paul Graney. So the switch now is going to be focusing on how we are applying this in our local communities and also in personal with family stories. So I'm pleased to have Paul here. I've known Paul for the last few years on and off, and especially his work, his great work in the Anna Dan group in doing research and also in reaching out to the diaspora farm.